Hello and welcome. Today we will start with module 7. Module 7 will focus on bilingualism and its effect. So far, let us have a quick recap. So far, we have looked at bilingual acquisition, bilingual uh, the workings of the bilingual brain, how the bilingual processing takes place at various levels from starting from speech level like phonological level to word level processing to sentence processing. So, after we have understood all of these the nuances and the finer aspects at each of these levels, now it is time for us to look at how does all of that add up, what, what is the consequence of having this kind of processes at work. So, bilingualism and its impact, its effect. The so effect is um, we will discuss this um, effect in two different uh, domains, one will be in the linguistic domain and the other will be in the non-linguistic domain. So, the first part will concentrate primarily on the metalinguistic abilities and uh, language abilities uh, that will be that has an impact of bilingualism. So, cognitive effects of bilingualism, when we say cognitive effects of bilingualism, we are looking at not only at the language aspect of it, language aspect as in the how the language structure changes, how the language uh, we all know that you know uh, for all of you it is quite common to find in Indian in the, in the urban Indian uh, lexicon even in Hindi when we speak in Hindi the word for flower in Hindi which is pool in it has changed into this has become something like this when we speak in Hindi, even, if, even when we speak in Hindi, right. So, even uh, for example, fall also has become fall. So, these are linguistic impacts on over uh, structural impact on the language of one language on another. So, English is impacting the Hindi here. So, this is on the surface, this is something that we see all the time. Uh, this is a very common outcome of bilingualism in any given society. But in this domain, in this uh, segment, we are focusing more on the cognitive aspects, on the mental aspects of cognitive uh, of bilingualism. And that even that uh, is visible at language level, language and metalinguistic level as well as non-linguistic level. So, bilingualism uh, has an impact not only on the linguistic uh, uh, linguistic level in terms of cognitive mechanism, but also in that in terms of non-linguistic level. So, non-linguistic level is also called the um, executive control or cognitive control, domain of cognitive control. So, we will look at each of them one by one. Now, um, how does bilingualism affect one's cognitive abilities? This is a question that is not new. We have seen before also when we started the course that bilingualism has gone through various stages of acceptance and uh, we can also say denial in uh, through century, through, through um, decades. In the initial stages bilingualism did not really enjoy a very uh, nice patronage from the academia, from the intellectual circles. So, the, and the question have been bothering uh, scientists for a very long time. The early studies um, had a negative report to give as, as far as um, from, uh, from today's perspective it was quite a negative um, answer. So, the question is very old, almost a century old, but the answers have varied over time, over decades. Early studies were primarily focused on disadvantages because if you recall, uh, we did talk about how the findings on bilingualism were basically tied to the performance in the school education and, and uh, in terms of policy and uh, education and so on, they were found to be lacking. So, school going children who were bilingual who has a different L1 at home and the school language of school, uh, school was L2, those children were found to be lacking in their abilities. So, that is where we go back to and as a result of which primary focus on bilingualism was its disadvantages. But today we talk about the same issues, the impact of bilingualism on cognitive abilities from an advantageous point of view. We now look at the advantages of being a bilingual rather than disadvantages of being a bilingual. Now, while, the, while there has been a tectonic shift, so to say, in terms of how bilingualism is looked at now, there is also a lot of new insights and lot of um, understanding, fine-grained understanding in terms of 
the nuances in terms of task demand. So, it is there are yes there are bilingual uh, there are advantages of being a bilingual. However, there are graded um, so to say responses to the various tasks. So, we also know not only we know that there are advantages, but today we also know that subtle nuances of task demands and other variables also play a role. So, bilingualism is not a monolith as we will see in this segment. So, being a bilingual and being a monolingual are not two uh, homogeneous things that we can compare. So, this is the very first uh, study that we have been we have referred to before as well. This uh, study goes back to 1923 almost a century back when the study the, when the test was carried out. The test is called Stanford Binet test of intelligence which is actually um, an updated version or standardized version on, on American uh, or let us say American version of the <coughs> Alfred Binet's IQ test which is even older. So, this particular test uh, uh, was used to on, on school going children to check their to determine their cognitive abilities. So, the study had um, juxtaposed monolinguals with bilinguals, monolinguals were all English speaking monolinguals and the bilinguals were Welsh English bilinguals. So, who had Welsh as L1 and by English as their L2. So, these are all school going children and they found out that in this entire test battery the score of the bilingual children were much lower as opposed to the score of the monolingual children which means that the monolingual uh, English children did a lot better than the bilingual children in the school in the same age group. This was one of the first studies to juxtapose bilinguals uh, with monolinguals in terms of their cognitive abilities because this test is not on language this is an IQ sort of an IQ test. This was a, um, a test of intelligence hence it had a direct correlation uh, of bilingualism with cognitive abilities. And because the bilingual children in this uh, test scored lower than their monolingual peers, it was taken as a proof of mental confusion of bilinguals. It was uh, projected that bilinguals are somehow confused because they have two languages to deal with and each language has its own um, you know baggage so to say. So, there is a confusion that the bilingual children are facing hence they are not able to cope up and they are not able to do as well as their monolingual counterparts. So, this is how it all started, this is how the disadvantage of being a bilingual um, was uh, put forward. However, in this study the English proficiency of the bilingual children was not taken into account. The reason why we are mentioning this is that today when we do any kind of such studies every single thing is measured. So, L1 proficiency, L2 proficiency alongside the IQ and various other any other random variables that might have an impact on the outcome. But this is 1923 and this is how it was done at that time. Now, uh, move forward about 30 years or so and then there was yet another landmark study in 1962, Peel and Lambert this also we have mentioned in the be in uh, before. So, this was again a task on verbal and non-verbal intelligence. This, um, the earlier study was only on IQ, this was on verbal as well as non-verbal test. The crucial difference here was the population. The study, the, the participants who took part in this study. In this particular study, they had French speaking English, um, French speaking uh, school going children, they were also fluent in English. This was on in Montreal where the, there was this immersion program going on for uh, Anglophone children in going to. Uh, French immersion programs. So, in this study however, what they found was that bilingual children outperformed their monolingual counterparts meaning bilingual children did way better than their monolingual uh, friends not uh, in all tests including non-verbal intelligence meaning including tests that were similar to the IQ test done before. Now, this test had turned the table significantly in terms of understanding the impact of bilingualism in on children. So, this in this study it is showing advantage where, whereas the previous study showed disadvantage. After this after 1962's uh, this particular study they found the that now we can look at it without the tag of being a disadvantage. 
So, not only they found advantage in terms of linguistic task, non-linguistic task, they also had found better performance in symbol manipulation and symbol reorganizing. So, an overall advantage of being a bilingual now started getting associated with speaking two languages. It all started in 1962. So, after this important landmark study in 1962, a lot of research has uh, taken place, lot of studies have um, come out in uh, investigating this particular uh, phenomena. So, connecting bilingualism with cognitive abilities. Now, the primary focus of all of these studies have been uh, two ways, there have been two main focus. One is the linguistic and the metalinguistic abilities, how they are affected and uh, simultaneously what are the cognitive abilities. The reason we are including metalinguistic abilities here is that this also includes cognitive abilities to a certain extent. We will shortly see why. So, the 1923 study did only IQ test, there was no language performance test, there was no verbal test. 62 study did uh, both verbal and non-verbal test and the bilinguals have uh, found to be better and gradually studies had uh, started taking into account a larger number of tests that spanned both linguistic and non-linguistic, both verbal and non-verbal intelligence into account. So, when we are talking about verbal intelligence, we are talking about in today's terminology, we call them language and metalinguistic abilities. And when we talk about cognitive abilities, we all we take into account all these various factors. Cognitive abilities or cognitive control or executive function as they are called, they, uh, they include various subdomains. So, we will see them one by one. Let us start with language and metalinguistic abilities of bilinguals. Now, one this is almost commonsensical that a bilinguals first and foremost uh, the most important thing that should be noticeable in a bilingual is that the language will change. There will be changes in his linguistic abilities that should be the most common thing to notice. As I said in the very beginning that a Hindi speaker using uh, fool rather than pool which is the actual pronunciation is something very noticeable. Similar things have been talked about before also. So, the most noticeable um, effect of bilingualism should be language and that is where this entire study goes back to. Now, this view encouraged studying a lot of um, uh, bilingual versus monolingual groups starting in the 1970s to 80s, it is still going on. So, the focus has been when we talk about metalinguistic abilities, what do we basically mean? We mean two, two things primarily, one is that we explicit knowledge of the linguistic structure. Speaking is one thing, but being aware of what we are speaking is a completely different thing. How many of us are aware that you know in English you use ing because of course you are taught through grammar, but at the same time if you are a uh, let us say you are a monolingual, you are not taught the language in through formal methods, you just pick it up from your parents, from your peer group, from home and at home and in, in, in the playground and so on. Nobody really teaches you explicitly that in this language the progressive marker is this, the plural marker is this and so on. So, that awareness is different from your skill of using them. So, metalinguistic awareness takes us to that level. So, explicit knowledge of the linguistic structure, exactly what is happening at a structural level and then the ability to access that structure intentionally. So, you should be able to parse them that you know this structure is this is the this is the particular pattern of you know, this grammatical function that is the, the, uh, then there is another pattern B, pattern C and so on and if needed we should be able to separate them out. So, that is what is basically metalinguistic ability and this ability develops in children in small starting from very small children and we will see how that ability is different or whether they are different among monolinguals and bilinguals. Why is it important? Why are we even talking about it? This awareness is very important because it is an useful tool for development of complex use of language. Only when you are aware of the structural complexities and the way they can be manipulated is when you can use complex sentences and you can put to you, put language to use for better purposes. 
this is something Chomsky has told, uh, already told that the ineptness hypothesis talks about that all the structure is already there in an algorithmic form, the child is in born with that capacity. So, in terms of psycholinguistic research, we look at those abilities through some experimental uh, situations, through some lab laboratory scenarios. So, metalinguistic abilities can be can be investigated at these two level, linguistic level and at cognitive level. Now, at linguistic level, what we mean by metalinguistic uh, understanding or awareness is that the ability to separate form and meaning, form and meaning as in the word as it looks. So, the sun, the word the sun S U N refers to a particular thing. So, let us say this is the form and this is the meaning. Okay. Let us just take it as a sun. So, this, this is the meaning, this is, this is the form, this is the meaning, this is what we mean by separating form and meaning. So, the ability to separate these two is the at the very root of metalinguistic awareness. And then the ability to make judgment on semantics, phonology, uh, monomorphology, syntactic, various aspects of, lang of the language. So, this is at the level of linguistics, at the level of language, the metalinguistic understanding. This also has a cognitive counterpart. How? Once you have understood that there are different layers to language, it is not one concrete solid whole, it has various, uh, various um, aspects to it, various parts to it or let us say various nodes to it. Once you have separated those nodes in your head, now you should be able to handle them separately if needed or you can, you should be able to uh, use certain permutations and combinations of these various factors. That is where cognitive control comes in, comes into the picture. So, the once the separation is done, form and meaning separation is done, attention control is required to focus on them separately if need be. Why should we need that kind of a trick? We will see. So, this again goes back to all this understanding goes back to Vygotsky by 1962. He was the first to propose that bilingualism might affect children's ability in the metalinguistic domain. He was the first to propose this. Now, we are talking about metalinguistic abilities being uh, one of the domains to study impact of bilingualism, but this is this comes from Vygotsky in 1962. He said that bilingual children are more accustomed to the arbitrariness of the form meaning connection. All every all students of linguistics know that the associates uh, famous signifier signified uh, connection. Again to draw a very bad picture, this is, so this is the signifier, this is the signified. So, this is the form, this is the meaning, right. So, this kind of a form meaning connection, the very fact that this connection is arbitrary is more apparent to a bilingual than to a monolingual is what Vygotsky said. Why should it this be so? When you are a monolingual, you are automatically, you are this, this becomes almost an automatic process that this is called a tree and this is called the sun, right? This is an automatic process, this is how you learn. But the moment you learn another language, then you become aware that this particular thing that this signified or the meaning has another form, another form as in let us say if you are, uh, if you are a Hindi speaker, you can also call it Suraj. So, as a result of which these two are equivalent. You see this becomes very apparent to a bilingual child the moment he starts learning a second language. They realize that the form meaning can remain constant, but the forms can change. Hence, form meaning separation is possible or to put it in a different way that form and meaning are arbitrarily connected and they are separable in terms of understanding. That is why Vygotsky says that bilingualism could be a very important trigger to create that awareness, that level of metalinguistic awareness. So, he predicted that bilingual children would do better in what uh, uh, Piaget's uh, famous task called sun moon task. This is a very, very interesting task that is used for children to see if they can separate form and meaning connection and to what extent. So, the sun moon a task that requires changing of names of objects, well known objects and their roles. So, the sun appears in the day, the moon appears at night. 
Now there are tasks where the, the child children will be given uh, something like this. If the sun were called the moon and the moon was called the sun, then the sun would be part of, sun will be up at night and it will be dark. This kind of a structure is created, there are various games, there are um, sun moon stroop tasks also that are available, they, these, are, these are tasks that are used with children. So, if they will be said that let us call the moon the sun and the sun the moon, now who will be up at night, right? And how will it be? Will it be dark? Will it be bright? And so on. This kind of task checks the child's ability to separate out the name from the function. So, the name does not really, so you can call the sun the moon, it does not matter if it is up at night, it is up at night, the function is different from the name. So, that separation is what is at the root of sun moon task created by Piaget. So, Vygotsky uh, proposed that in this kind of task bilingual children will do better compared to monolingual children simply because bilingualism itself gives them the understanding that same uh, meaning, same uh, signified can have different signifiers. So, that separation is already inbuilt. So, this was has already been proved now that bilinguals exhibit superior performance in this kind of task, sun moon, various versions of sun and moon task. So, this basically takes us to the greater symbolic flexibility of bilingual children because the reason being that this task also requires a certain amount of control on the attentional mechanism, right? So, there are many other kinds of metalinguistic awareness as well uh, which are more, more based on language ability. So, syntactic awareness, word awareness, phonological awareness and so on. So, there are um, as you see as we as we are building up the story that there are awareness metaling at metalinguistic level that bilingualism probably has a connection with. Metalinguistic awareness has to do with the awareness about structural properties of language and the ability to focus on those properties individually, right. So, in, and in those cases if you are able to uh, focus on each of the properties separately, this will also be seen in tasks that require that kind of form meaning separation. So, and that kind of uh, bilinguals have been found to be doing much better than monolinguals on those kind of tasks. Now, we will get a little more into detail on this. Now, this is in the background current approach to linguistic and metalinguistic abilities because of this various uh, nuances into it because of the attentional mechanism inbuilt and language ability inbuilt. Because of this now the current approach is to use tasks that are different in terms of how much of it depends on language ability and how much of it depends on executive control ability, right. So, there are different kinds of tasks based on their graded dependence on language and executive control. So, there are three kinds of tasks that are typically used because bilingual the language ability as we have seen linguistic tasks can also have a measure of cognitive control mechanism inbuilt. So, if you uh, combine the linguistic ability and cognitive ability in various degrees, there are these three kinds of tasks that you get which have been used um, by many groups of researchers in this domain work test grammaticality judgment and the verbal fluency task. So, work test is uh, actually it goes back to 1958, it was uh, designed in order to check for morphological awareness in English language. It was not designed for uh, checking bilingual proficiency as such, uh, but this was this is a very interesting task where work is not a is not a being, it is a nonsensical uh, a word, nonsensical thing and it is created like this. This task is primarily dependent on mostly heavily dependent on knowledge of the morphological processes of a particular language English in this case. So, they use this um, words like work and many other such non, non words and create a scenario. So, scenario is like this, this is a work first they introduce the idea that this is a being a something a something that can be called a work. Now, there is another one there are two of them. So, there are two what will be the form of work in this particular case. This is how the test goes. There are many manipulations to this, many uh, layers to this, but this is at the root of it. So, what is the 
morphological process of forming plural in English is in this particular, this particular uh, plate shows us that. Now this is uh, entirely about linguistic knowledge, linguistic knowledge as in completely dependent on the language aspect of forming plural. Hence, but this knowledge is implicit in case of monolingual children this knowledge is implicit, you know it, so you just know it. You, it is not like you are come consciously sitting and deciding ok let me put an S because S is a plural marker and so on. However, if there is a task like this you need to bring that implicit knowledge out in the open as in you have to make it explicit because this is not a thing that you have been ever been used to. So, it is not a it is you are using the same morphological marker for a completely new novel I, uh, entity and hence we are talking about explicity here. So, explicit use of a particular morphological process which is otherwise implicit knowledge. However, even if there is a kind of a mechanism involved here, but there is no it is not a big uh, big problem because there is no competition, there is no other uh, you know there you do not have to do another process simultaneously. This is only one simple process your awareness about the morphological marker for plurality that is it. So, it is very high on the level of linguistic knowledge, but not very not uh, at all uh, high on the executive control level. So, if we if we take both uh, level of linguistic knowledge as well as executive control uh, mechanism, then you have this is high and this is low in this particular kind of a task, right. You need primarily linguistic knowledge, but not, not much of executive control mechanism. So, one of these studies that was uh, done by Ballistock in 2012, they used the same task on 6 year old bilinguals who were fluent in English and they had 3 different other languages. So, they were fluent in English and French, fluent in English and Spanish as well as Chinese English bilinguals. So, 3 kinds of bilingual children where uh, they took part in this study. So, Spanish English and Chinese English bilingual groups were being educated in English whereas the French English bilingual groups were being educated in French. So, you see there are different uh, types of groups they are all bilingual however, they had different first languages as well as they had different language of education whereas two groups had English as their medium of education another group had French as their group uh, uh, medium of education. So, these are the different uh, variables that they used and uh, scores for English vocabulary and grammar knowledge were equivalent for the Spanish English bilinguals and English monolinguals for the control group, but the scores in English were lower for the others. So, the uh, French group and the Chinese group had lower uh, vocabulary score as opposed to the Spanish English bilinguals. So, there are 3 different vari variables that are being utilized here the English um, score, English uh, vocabulary and grammar score. Second was the uh, first language, the, there were 3 different first language groups that were used. Third variable was the language of education in which the, the schools were using. The results are show that Spanish English bilinguals outperform the English monolinguals on the work test. Only one group did better than monolingual control which is the Spanish English bilingual. Remember Spanish English bilinguals were also uh, had high score in their English grammar and vocabulary uh, performance. On the other hand the Chinese English and the French English bilinguals did not differ from each other and also with respect to the monolinguals in their performance. This brings us brings to the focus that being a bilingual is not exactly a marker of your um, of the impact. Bilingualism also has various layers as we see here. So, on the one hand the Spanish English bilinguals did better meaning they showed an advantage in terms of uh, metalinguistic awareness is in this domain even though it is a completely linguistic task. However, the others did not because there are significant differences between them. So, these factors also need to be looked at. So, what are the factors? One was the, the first groups Spanish English groups educational background in English which is not the case with in case of French English bilinguals and also the linguistic overlap between English and Spanish. 
overlap between English and Spanish is much higher compared to overlap between Spanish and uh, French and English and Chinese and English. Okay. So, that also seems to be one important factor. Similar tasks have been uh, done by uh, many other groups. Another important study was uh, in done in 2003. They looked at the performance of um, French immersion programs, students in French immersion programs and they also showed equivalent performance by bilinguals and monolinguals on this task. So, the factor is that if the language skill of vocabulary as well as grammar are comparable then both monolinguals and bilinguals will do equally well or sometimes bilinguals tend to do better in work test. That is one, uh, one of the major findings. Now, second uh, type of task that have been used in this domain is called grammaticality judgment task. Grammaticality judgment task is a very simple task where a sentence is given to the participants and they are asked to say yes or no uh, uh, in terms of whether the sentence is grammatical or not, very simple task. However, this task is typically manipulated in such a way that we bring in another level of com, um, problem which challenges the uh, automatic response. So, it basically combining linguistic knowledge with executive control. So, not only the sentences are based divided on grammaticality that is grammatical versus non-grammatical, but there is also another um, a variable that is built into this which is the semantic anomaly. Semantic anomaly as in sentences like the um, a sentence like the bad dog beat the man is grammatical as well as perfectly fine sentence. However, the man beat the dog is also a grammatical sentence, however, it is semantically anomalous. So, that is the nuance in this kind of a uh, task that is typically built in. So, the probe sentences are typically semantically anomalous, however, grammatically correct. That is the probe sentence in this kind of tasks. So, in order to know the knowledge of in one domain, in part this particular case the knowledge of grammaticality, the, the participant now has to have face a competition from the uh, domain of semantics as well. So, there is there are two domains here, there is, uh, there is grammar as well as there is semantics in the, let us put it like this, grammar versus semantics. Okay. So, if grammar on the on the one hand it can be plus grammatical plus semantically fine, it can be plus grammatical minus semantics and the other way. So, our target probe in this case is this case when sentences are semantically um, anomalous however grammatically correct. So, what is happening here is we are giving two tasks to the participant at the same time even though they are not being told about it, they are not overtly told. What they are told is that check the grammaticality of the sentence. However, because when we see a sentence or when we hear a sentence both in auditory versus visual processing of a sentence, looking at the meaning, understanding the meaning is an automatic process. It is not something that you need to you know do as a conscious process, hence the competition occurs. And this as a result, we have two different layers of this of task into built into one task. This was utilized by uh, Ballistock in, uh, in her famous study in 1986, which have been replicated by many others with similar kind of findings. So, in this particular study, she had um, children as uh, participants and um, they created a story like there is a puppet figure who falls down the stumbles down the steps and bumps his head. Uh, um, and as a result starts saying funny sentences, starts saying silly sentences. The task was for the children to just see if the sentences that the puppet is creating are grammatical or not or they called it was the, was the sentence right way, was it the proper sentence, was it a right sentence. Because for children you do not, you cannot really use heavy words like grammatical, semantic and stuff like that. So, the, ta the probe question was, was the sentence right way. And there were sentences like this. So, there were some sentences which were perfectly fine semantically as well as grammatically and then there were sentences like this. And, and as we have just said that understanding meaning is an automatic process and it is difficult to ignore. So, when you have a sentence like this, the semantics of it, the semantic anomaly of it 
is automatically processed and hence it should it should hinder your processing of the grammaticality aspect. However, <coughs> bilingual children were found to be better at ignoring the meaning and focusing on the grammatical aspect meaning bilingual children had better accuracy and less reaction time in this kind of scenario where they are supposed to ignore. They were told that there are some, some sentences might be silly because he has bumped his head uh, while falling down. So, he might just you know create sentences that do not make sense, but just say if the sentences are created right way and bilingual children are found to be doing better. There are many other studies like this in a similar study sentence judgment task was used and this they tried to see if control and language knowledge are also are equally uh, contributing to the results that we find. So, in this case children were 5 year old Swedish English uh, fully bilingual and partially bilingual. So, this is a slight difference from the uh, previous study. Previous study had used monolingual versus bilingual children. In this study Swedish English bilingual uh, study they used uh, full bilingual and partially bilingual basically depend, uh, dividing them in terms of proficiency and hence the language knowledge does proficiency have a role to play in this kind of a task. So, what they found was that full bilinguals outperform their Swedish monolingual peers on both the ungrammatical and semantically anomaly anomalous sentences. So, they had a semantic uh, sentence judgment two tasks here they had grammaticality as well as uh, ungrammatical versus ungrammatical and semantic anomaly sentences. So, they found that the full bilinguals as in high proficient bilinguals are doing better than their monolingual peers. However, partial bilingual children scored numerically higher than the monolingual children, but they did not differ significantly on the semantically anomalous sentences meaning that the they were not doing as well as the fully bilingual or the high proficient bilingual children. However, the catch is the participants who were less proficient were expected to perform worse. They were perform worse than the monolingual because their ability in the second language is not very high. Now, but still we do not see much of much of that happening. They did not differ significantly. There was not much of a difference. They were not doing better, but there was hardly any significant difference. The result uh, according to the um, authors according to Cromdell 1999 who, who conducted this study, they proposed that the reason for this the reason for even partial bilinguals to be doing almost equally well like monolinguals is because of superior executive control. So, language ability even if language ability is not at par the executive control mechanism can compensate for that right. So, that is what an interesting finding in this domain is that linguistic control and executive control are an integral part of even something that is seemingly an entirely linguistic task. Similar kind of studies have been conducted on adults as well adult bilinguals and same kind of results have been found that but bilinguals outperform monolinguals in all of these. In one such study in 2010 they had done also they had used ERP along with the behavioral study and they showed that bilinguals perform better in conflict task and also they had better management skill in terms of the brain activity. So, they found that the conflict in terms of P600 output we have discussed P600 output in uh, in terms of processing before. So, bilinguals uh, showed better performance uh, as, as was found out through ERP signals that they had better ability to control the conflict as well. Not only they did perform well in the in the behavioral task, but mentally also as in in terms of neurological uh, neuro, neural aspects they are also doing it better they are handling the situation better. Now, the third type is the vocabulary test. Vocabulary test as in how uh, the vocabulary whether there are probe, uh, what kind of size of vocabulary do you have um, uh, of a bilingual versus a monolingual and so on. One of the initial studies the Pearson et al 1993 they looked at children's receptive and productive vocabulary um, on, on based on certain inventory this is called MacArthur communicative development inventory they use that to check the receptive and productive vocabulary of bilinguals and they found that bilinguals did worse than monolinguals. 
This is why we often um, see in the literature that bilinguals are typically found to have less vocabulary, the size of vocabulary of bilinguals is lesser than the monolingual peers. So, this study goes back to this uh, 1993 and the subjects, the participants were children aged between 8 to 30 months, very young children as they are building their vocabulary this study was carried out and they found that monolinguals, um, they had monolinguals and simultaneous bilinguals. Obviously, if you are looking at bilinguals at 8 months, they are all simultaneous bilinguals, they are learning both the languages at the same time. And here, even then they found that bilinguals were doing slightly uh, worse than the monolinguals. So, total conceptual vocabulary however, uh, they had also used conceptual vocabulary measure and they found that in number of uh, in terms of number of concepts there was no difference. So, in terms of vocabulary there was a difference, but in terms of the learning and um, learning of concepts there was no difference. So, bilinguals and monolinguals did uh, similarly in terms of concept learning, but in terms of vocabulary learning there was a difference. Another study uh, by Bialystok in 2010 conducted a receptive vocabulary test uh, for older children aged 3 to 10 years and this has uh, a huge uh, database of, of 1700 children. So, this the task here was Peabody picture um, uh, vocabulary test and they found certain disparities. Uh, for example, in case of the uh, subset of 6 year old children, all children did similarly in words that are associated with schooling that the words that you learn in the formal environment in terms of formal teaching of language, uh, these words are uh, were associated with that kind of a scenario. So, astronaut, rectangle, writing and so on versus there were words like squash, cano, pitcher and so on that are used for at home. So, if on the basis of this kind of a division depending on what kind of words are used in which context, there was slight disparity, there were some, some differences. So, all children did similarly in the words associated with schooling, but there was a difference in terms of the words that are associated with home. But on the whole, the overall picture is like this, this is the taken from Barrister 10 uh, her paper. As you can see across all the age uh, groups 3 year, 4 year, 3 to 10 years entire study bilingual uh, proficiency is much less compared to the monolingual. So, bilingual uh, in terms of uh, in the language of schooling monolingual children did consistently better than bilinguals in or uh, across all the age groups. That is why we commonly say that bilinguals have less um, uh, vocabulary knowledge as opposed to monolinguals. Similarly, there are also uh, tasks that are called verbal fluency tasks. Verbal fluency tasks are the tasks that use language proficiency and integrity of brain functioning. This is a something related to verbal um, vocabulary task, but slightly different because here they do we check not only the vocabulary, but also in terms of how you can associate that vocabulary to various kinds of domains. For example, the, the tasks uh, typically are the participants are asked to use or generate as many words as possible in a particular category, semantic category okay, uh, within a particular time frame. So, 60 seconds typically within 60 seconds. So, um, name as many fruits as you can uh, as you can within next 60 seconds, name as many flowers as you can, name as many cars as you can something like this. So, this is uh, generating words within one semantic category, one larger semantic category that is one type. Another is, uh, is the, what is called uh, creating words starting with a particular alphabet. So, uh, name as many words as you can uh, that starts with the alphabet A or starts with the alphabet B for example. So, this is these are the two varieties of the verbal fluency task. Now, we will see shortly why this is very interesting. These tasks are based on or say related to vocabulary knowledge, right. So, how many words you know either in the semantic domain or in the uh, or in terms of alphabetical arrangement, but the demands on these two tasks are very different. Demands are two different different because one of them is based on a similar uh, automatic process, the other is a conscious process. So, in the terms of category fluency which is the semantic category now you like name of fruits, name of flowers and so on, this has less demand on control system. 
because the task is consistent with semantic memory. Remember our um, uh, representation uh, memory, bilingual memory in terms of representations and so on. So, we know that uh, when the conceptual storage is created, semantic memory is based on association of various types, association of various types in terms of uh, um, connections, semantic connection, associative connection and so on. So, this is something we have already seen. So, this is how the mental storage really works. As a result of which, if you have access to one word, if you, if you have if you are using the word apple if you and then automatically oranges and mangoes and stuff are the other things like this automatically come to your mind and hence it is called a, a automatic system. So, it has less demand on your control system you do not really need to put too much of pressure. However, letter fluency which is uh, uh, generating as many words as possible with a particular alphabet this puts a certain amount of pressure on your control mechanism. because no words are not stored alphabetically in our mind. It might be stored alphabetically in a dictionary, in a in a in a physical dictionary or in a, in a virtual dictionary, but that is not how the human mind stores it. Human mind stores it in boxes of semantic categories and other associations, but not in terms of alphabetic order. And hence, if you have to generate words based on alphabets, you need a certain amount of effort in processing and monitoring, right? So as a result of which you have a an added amount of cost that is that is part of this kind of a task. And also there are additional exclusionary criteria like no morphological variants. So, you cannot say uh, go and going and you know walk walked like that that is that is uh, not allowed in this kind of a test. So, you have to say walk and then you have to really sit down and think another word with the starts with W proper names are also out, numbers are also out. So, there are lots of constraints that are typically placed in terms of letter fluency task as opposed to category fluency task. As a result of which verbal fluency task when it takes care of both of these is a complex task that has um, very high demand on executive control mechanisms. So, this is uh, one such uh, study that uh, has uh, looked into this and various other studies have also taken place I have given the references here. So, typical findings uh, of all of these studies in this domain they refer to that similar results will be obtained between bilingual and monolingual children as well as adults in their letter fluency task. Even when the vocabulary in L2 is weaker even if L2 vocabulary is weaker which is often the case in case of bilinguals even then the letter fluency task will be done better by bilinguals as opposed to monolinguals. In terms of control vocabulary size so there are various parameters that are used. So, if we uh, keep the vocabulary size uh, controlled in that case the findings show that bilingual adults performed better than their monolinguals right on letter fluency task and comparably in category fluency task. So, in category fluency task there is hardly any difference uh, whatever may, may be the parameter. In letter fluency task there are sometimes similarity sometimes bilinguals even do better than monolinguals if the vocabulary size is controlled. And not only that there have been studies that looked at the time course for lexical retrieval and this found that the rate of decline because over a period of time you may uh, as the time goes the time the, the, the number of words that you can generate basically decreases. But even in that case what they find is that for bilinguals it was less steep for both low and high proficient bilinguals. Monolinguals had a has suffered more in this kind of a case but bilinguals suffered less even if they are low proficient. Both types of bilinguals low proficient and high proficient bilinguals did better. So, the most important uh, take home lesson for, for this uh, study is that bilinguals are better able to employ superior executive control even in case of linguistic task. All of these are linguistic tasks work test, vocabulary, uh, fl um, verbal fluency task or grammaticality judgment starting from work test to the last one we have seen that gradually for each of these tasks we can include more and more amount of cognitive control elements. We can put some amount of competition 
when they are speaking, when they are generating or understanding language, there is an amount of competition that you can build in into the linguistic task depending on the task the degree varies. So, in work task it is primarily linguistic task, but in verbal fluency task a heavy amount of uh, control mechanism is also inbuilt because of the letter fluency task. Similarly, grammatically the judgment if you include the semantically anomalous sentences being brings in the executive control mechanism. So, whenever there are executive control mechanisms inbuilt bilinguals have typically outperformed the monolingual peers even if their vocabulary was weaker. And in the work test also there are similar kind of findings in terms of bilingual versus monolingual participants. So, basically the um, bi bilinguals are able to better resist interference, better resist interference generated by various kinds of competitors in case of both in case of grammaticality judgment as well as in case of uh, verbal fluency judgment semantic association or semantic uh, competitors are, uh, are creating a competition in the production or in the comprehension process. So, in that, that kind of a situation when you have to have exercise some amount of inhibition, inhibition of the competitors in this case semantic competitors in all of these cases bilinguals have always found to be outperforming monolinguals. So, that is about the um, metalinguistic awareness of bilinguals as opposed to monolinguals and the basic lesson take home lesson from this segment is that bilinguals seem to do at least similarly and sometimes better given if the executive control mechanism is an inbuilt part of the experimental setup. So, this is about metalinguistic awareness. In the next segment we will look at non-linguistic task which focuses primarily on executive control and not on linguistic task. Till now we looked at linguistic task which had executive control also. Now we will look at only at non-linguistic task in the next segment. Mm -hmm.